Good evening. Welcome everyone to the meeting. Before we proceed with the committee meeting, North House Council joins the whole nation, the royal family, in mourning the death of Her Majesty the Queen. On behalf of our residents, we'd like to express our deepest sympathies to the royal family. As the longest service monarch in British history, the Majesty the Queen devotes her life to our country as a symbol of unity, strength and hope for all of us. Please could you join me in standing for a minute's silence in memory of Her Majesty the Queen. Thank you, everyone. I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny manager to confirm officers joining us remotely can be can hear and be heard. Thank you, Will. We actually don't have anybody joining us right now. So, ahead. thank you. Yes. First of all, apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Daniel Allen. Having given due notice, Councillor Nigel Mason had advised he was substituting for Councillor Daniel Allen. Uh, Councillor Mason will be with us in about 10 minutes. Are there any other apologies? Thank you. Item two. Minutes of the meeting of the 31st of March and the 23rd of June 2022. I'd like to take these two meetings separately, please. We have two sets of minutes to consider this evening. As there's an amendment to be made to one, I will take them separately. I would like to propose that we take as read and approve the minutes of the meeting on the 31st of March 2022 as a true recording of proceedings. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Tyson? Uh, yes, happy to second. Thank you. Will come in the vote, please? Thank you, Chair. That motion's carried. Thank you. I have been advised that there's an amendment to be made to the minutes of the meeting the 23rd of June 2022. At a minute to 12 to include the resolution of a section of the officer's recommendation that there was omitted by error. If you remember, if you were there, it was very late in the meeting. Uh, that we're talking about. The amendment is to include words as follows. For members, this uh, will replace the paragraph which is on page 33 of your pack. The amendment is that the applicant agrees on necessary extensions to the statutory determination period to enable the completion of the deed of variation, section 106 agreement. In the event this agreement is not secured to extend the statutory determination, the members allow the development and conservation manager to refuse planning permission based on absence of requisite legal agreement. I'd like to propose this amendment be made. Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Tyson? 
Yes, I'll second that. Thank you. Welcome to Councillor Mason. Um, you may not vote on this. Welcome, guest vote, please. Thank you, Chair. That motion's carried. Thank you. So we will now vote on the minutes. I would like to pro propose that the minutes of the meeting, the 23rd of June 2022, as amended, be accepted as a true recording of proceedings. Can I have a second, please? Councillor yes. Tyson? Yes, happy to second. Thank you. And vote, please, Will. Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Thank you. Notification of any other business. There is none. Chair's announcements. Recording. In accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording via the NHDC YouTube channel. Declarations of interest. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. To clarify matters for the to speakers, members of the public have five minutes for each group of speakers, i.e. five minutes for objectors and five minutes for supporters. This five minute time limit allowed also applies to member advocates. A warning will be given after four and a half minutes to alert you that you have 30 seconds left. At five minutes, you'll be advised that time allowed has ended and the speaker must cease. Public participation. I can confirm that we have three registered speakers who are in attendance. Item six, which is at 17 stroke 014640 uh, stroke one, land adjacent to Oakley and south of Cowards Lane, Codicut. Outline application for residential development for up to 83 dwellings. All matters reserved except access. As amended by plans and documents received the 4th of January 2019 and the 21st of January 2022. Please note the supplementary agenda pack contain an addendum to the report. Naomi Reynolds to present. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to start with a few updates um, and then um, summarize the report. Um, first of all, I'd like to start with an update on the emerging local plan. Um, on Tuesday, members should have received a link to an addendum to the report, which is on the website, um, which provided a written update regarding the emerging local plan. For the benefit of everyone else um, present and viewing, I'll summarise this update now. This updates the section in the report um, covering the allocation and with the emerging local, within the emerging local plan, starting at paragraph 4.3.167. On the 8th of September this year, the Council received the Inspector's final report on the examination of the North Hertfordshire Local Plan 2011 to 2031, um, which I'll refer to as the Emerging Local Plan. And receipt of the Inspector's report marks the end of the examination. The Inspector's report concludes that subject to a number of main modifications set out in the appendix to the report, the North Hertfordshire Local Plan 2011 to 2031, is sound, legally compliant and capable of adoption. The inspector's report can be viewed on the website. With regards to decision making and determining planning applications, this now means that the policies and site allocations within the North Hearts Local Plan 2011 to 2031 can be given very significant weight. And I highlighted in the document circulated to members some of the paragraphs within the inspector's final report, which are particularly relevant to this application. Um, since the report was written, I've had some representations which I'm just going to mention. 
And um, so since the report was written, there's two additional representations have been received from local residents, which again can be viewed on the council's website. They reiterated objections already included in the summary of representations in the report. And in particular, they refer to cumulative impacts of development in Codicott, lack of infrastructure, lack of demand for housing, and increased congestion on narrow High Street and Cowards Lane. They also refer to problems with the recently approved development. They also received a representation from Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust, um, and they made the following comments, and I'll quote them. One of the major points I make is regarding the 12 metre buffer to hedgerows. In this proposal, the applicant has provided six metre buffers to much of the hedgerow network, which has been endorsed by Hearts Ecology, based on their interpretation of the emerging policy. It is our contention that this is not correct and effectively destroys one of the most commendable policies of the local plan. The 12 metre buffer is explicitly endorsed by the inspector in his report in which he says, 790 main modifications MM166 FM100 includes all the alterations discussed above. It also includes the addition of detail regarding buffers of complementary habitat around designated sites and other assets of the natural environment. This is a suitable approach and for effectiveness, the 12 meters specified in respect of wildlife sites, trees and hedgerows is reasonable and appropriate. In short, all the changes brought about by MM175 and MM166 FM100, both to policy NE6 and the paragraph supporting it, are necessary to ensure these aspects of the plan are justified, effective and consistent with national policy. It is therefore not consistent with this policy and the inspector's reasoning to cut this buffer in half. The policy clearly states 12 metres, so this should be applied. There's a few more updates just with a couple of errors in the report. On the front page of the report, I've noticed the applicant's name is omitted in error. Um, the applicant is Warden Developments Limited. There's also an error in paragraph 4.3.1. Um, it refers to full application and it should refer to outline application. There's also an error in informative two, which refer, relates to off-site highway works. The numbers of the conditions it relates to are missed off in error. It should read the off-site highways works referred to in conditions 17 and 18. I'm just going to move on now to the photographs, if that's okay. Thank you. So this is a plan of the site and move, oh, sorry, this is the um, GIS plan of the site. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in the plans in a minute. This first photo is a view across the site from the existing field gate looking south. The Leylandi trees you can see on the left um, of the photo are along the boundary of, with Hollard's farm and are not within the ownership of the applicant. The second photo, please. And this is a view across the site from the existing field gate looking towards the east. And you can see the property Oakley on Cowards Lane in the centre of the photo. And there's a row of houses behind that along Cowards Lane. And the properties in the Riddy are behind the trees on the left hand side of the photo. Have the next photo. please. And this is a view of the site from the opposite side of the B656. And the site is elevated from the road and you can see the high street, which is to the north and the junction with Cowards Lane. Next photo, please. And this is a closer view of the junction with Cowards Lane. Next photo, please. And this is a view looking west along Cowards Lane, which is a narrow rural lane with several properties, quite a few properties accessing onto. Next photo, please. This is a view looking west the other way along Cowards Lane. Um, sorry, looking east along Cowards Lane and the site is on the right. Um, next photo, please. And um, this is um, a photo taken of um, the properties opposite the site on the other side of the B656. And we can see driveways and access to a new small development of three houses and to the right, um, some dwellings. Next photo, please. This view is taken from um, the southwest of the site and um, from public footpath number 23. Um, and it's looking towards the site. The dwellings to the left of the photo are in the Riddy, and the site is um, beyond the trees to the right hand side of the photograph. And next photo, please. 
This view is a view from the southeast. It's taken from public footpath 36. Um, and the site is beyond the trees, which you can see in the center of the site, which are on adjacent farmland. Next photo, please. And um, this is a view again um, from the southeast, from footpath 36. Um, and development on the site vis visible from here. And you can see Hollard's farm on the right hand side of the photo. And next photo, please. And this is taken from the north. And um, this view is from the north. And it's um, from public footpath number five, which is near the junction with Rabley Heath Road. And the last photo, please. This photo is taken again um, from further west along footpath number five. And um, the site would be clearly visible from this location, um, but in my view, it would be seen in the context of the existing settlement edge of Codicott. It would sit behind, if you can see in that photo, um, the recent development of three houses on the opposite side of the B656, which you can see with sort of reddish roofs there. Um, if we could move on to the plans, please. And this is a site location plan. Um, which shows the uh, position of the site in Codicott on the southern side. And um, the next plan, please. And this is a parameter plan. Um, this plan has been submitted during the course of the application and it indicates the access and the planting buffers. And we'll have the next slide, please. Um, this is a proposed access plan showing the proposed access with visibility displays. In this case, all matters are reserved except access. It's an outline application. And the proposed site access would be off the B656 and Cowards Lane would be realigned so that it would have a junction with this new access rather than connect directly onto the B656, which is currently the case. And the next slide, please. And um, this is an illustrative layout plan um, as amended. This is an indicative layout plan and it's been submitted as part of the application and it demonstrates how 83 dwellings could be accommodated on the site. However, this plan is for information only, and should the application be approved, this plan would, be, would not be one of the approved plans because all matters are reserved except access. And then finally, if I could go to the last slide, I thought it'd be helpful to go back to the site location plan as I summarise the application. And um, so the proposal as amended um, seeks outline planning permission for up to 83 dwellings, of which 40% would be affordable. In this case, all matters are reserved except access. All other matters, so appearance, landscaping, layout and scale are reserved and would need to be subject to reserved matters application. And the application site is identified in the NHDC submission local plan 2011 to 2031, which I'll refer, shall refer to as the emerging local plan, as an allocated housing site under policy CD1. And in the emerging local plan, it proposes the whole site to be removed from the green belt for development and incorporated within the settlement boundary of Codicott. And the local plan is not adopted, and this site currently falls within the green belt. And paragraph 148 of the NPPF states the following. And when considering any planning application, local planning authorities should ensure that substantial weight is given to any harm to the green belt very special circumstances will not exist unless the potential harm to the green belt by reason of appropriateness and any other harm resulting from the proposal is clearly outweighed by other considerations. So as such, my, in the report, um, I've considered the potential harm to the green belt firstly and any other harm resulting from the proposal and then weighed this up against the other considerations. So the proposal is inappropriate development in the green belt, which is by definition harmful to the green belt to which significant weight should be attributed as required by the framework. The proposals would result in harm to the openness of the green belt, and this is attributed to significant weight. And there'd be moderate harm to the purposes of the green belt, and further moderate harm has also been identified by virtue of encroachment into the countryside. In the report, there's a table on pages 90 to 91, which sets out the harm and the benefits that would arise from the proposal and the weight that officers consider should be attributed to them in the planning balance. I won't repeat all the harm and benefits identified here, but I'll highlight a, um, a couple of the key concerns which have been raised by local residents and Codicott Parish Council. 
and many of the representations from the parish council and local residents um, were, um, raised concerns with regards to increased traffic, highway safety, particularly on the high street in Cowards Lane and parking issues, and these are all noted. However, in the absence of an objection from the Highway Authority, it's the officer's view that these would not be sustainable reasons to withhold planning permission. A parameter plan has been submitted as well, um, as we've showed earlier, and um, which indicates there would be a 12 metre buffer adjacent to the Hollods Farm Landscape Wildlife Site and 12, six metres, sorry, and six metre buffers to the rest of the southern boundary and part of the east and west boundaries. I mentioned earlier the, the objection from Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust, and that is acknowledged, and the comments in the inspector's um, final report are noted with regard to these 12 metre buffers. Um, However, whilst the emerging local plan policy states the provision of 12 metre buffers should be provided, it's not an absolute requirement of policy. It's necessary to implement these 12 metre buffers pragmatically, otherwise some of the smaller proposed housing allocation sites in the emerging local plan could well be undeliverable. And the scheme at Heath Lane did not have a 12 metre buffer throughout the site, but this was allowed by an inspector. Um, Harpshire Ecology is our statutory, statutory consultee and they've not raised an objection to this application so it's not considered that this is a sustainable reason to withhold permission. And the report sets out other considerations that it's concluded without weigh the harm to the green belt and any other harm resulting from the proposal. And these are listed as benefits in the table on pages 90 to 91. So there are two aspects which weigh heavily in favour of this proposed development. The first main aspect considered to weigh very heavily in favour of the proposed development is that the proposal would bring forward up to 83 housing units, of which 40% would be affordable. The committee report outlines that the council is only able to demonstrate 1.47 years of housing land compared with the minimum requirement of five years and that, unfortunately, there has been a historic chronic undersupply of housing over the last, at least the past 10 years. So in the context of the council's housing land supply situation and the historic undersupply, the provision of up to 83 dwellings, with 40% of those being affordable, in this case merits very substantial weight in favour of the proposed development. The second key consideration in favour of the proposal is the allocation of the site in the emerging local plan under policy CD1. I've mentioned already the receipt of the inspector's report, and this does not change the recommendation for the application as set out in the committee report. In fact, it strengthens the recommendation that planning permission be granted, because it means now that, that now very significant weight can be given to relevant policies in the um, North Hertfordshire Local Plan 2011 to 2031, when determined planning applications. And I'd like to draw your attention to in paragraph 496, the inspector says, I conclude that the proposed housing allocations are justified, effective, consistent with national policy and positively prepared. So it is your officer's view, applying the approach set out in paragraph 148 of the MPPF, that the other considerations identified, particularly those related to provision of market and affordable housing, clearly outweigh the potential harm to the greenbelt by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm resulting from the proposal. Very special circumstances therefore exist to justify permission in officers' view. Whilst this ca each case turns on its own merits, such an approach which includes the provision of market and affordable housing in the context of a lack of a five-year housing land supply has been supported by the Secretary of State in other decisions, most notably the Heath Lane decision, which is attached to the report. As it is considered that very special circumstances apply in this case, regard should be given to provisions of paragraph 11D of the MPPF and the tilted balance. It is considered that the assets of particular importance, so green belt and heritage assets in this case, do not provide a clear reason for refusing the development, and any adverse impact of granting permission would not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the MPPF as a whole. Therefore, the development would accord with the MPPF and the development plan taken as a whole, and this points towards a grant of planning permission. I understand that it might be queried as to why this application is being considered before full council makes a decision on the adoption of the local plan. And in paragraphs 4.3.33 to 4.3.40 in the report cover the issue of prematurity. And it's considered that it would not be reasonable to refuse this application on prematurity grounds. 
A refusal could not be substantiated at appeal and the council would risk an award of costs as occurred on the Heath Lane um, in respect of the appeal at Heath Lane in Codicott. An extension of time has been agreed on this application until the end of September 2022. But after that date, the applicant has the right to appeal the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, for completeness, can I just inform the members that there was an email came in very late this afternoon from a resident uh, asking whether members had actually visited the site or not. That's just for your information. But now you've got all the information that's, that's available. Um, can I now ask members if they have any questions of Naomi Raynor? Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions, one more for clarification more than anything else. The 12 metre buffer that you mentioned about, um, the applicant is obviously given six metres. Has the landowner been spoken to about the other six metres? Um, yes, with regards to um, that question, when um, this was a, mo a modification of the plan during the course of this ap the application, the 12 metre buffer, and it's something that was discussed um, with the applicant um, and went, went back to them on, um, and they put forward the scheme as submitted, which is not all with the 12 metre buffer just along the wildlife site. It's something then that went back to Hearts Ecology and they were consulted on it and they agreed that it would be, would be acceptable would be un sorry, unacceptable or acceptable? Uh, acceptable. acceptable. So um, they've raised no objections to the amended scheme. I guess um, we've looked at it pragmatically. The concern with this is if we went with 12 metre buffers on these sort of smaller sites, they could end up being undeliverable because of the land take. Okay, and Chair, second question if you may. Um, can I come back to you? Yeah. Uh, Councillor David Levitt. Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned that the applicant has agreed to an extension till the end of September. Um, when was that um, extension agreed? Was it was was it before the applicant was aware that we'd received the inspector's uh, report back with the revised conditions and not that? Um, and if it was, have we since contacted them? Said, bearing in mind that we now have the inspector's report. Uh, and the amendments that he proposes and that and that it is due for adoption um, or would they consider another uh, extension or deferment until actually the things in place because I've found this report very difficult to read with all the extra bits and pieces and changes and referring backwards and forwards it would have been nice to have seen I know I know this time wise but it would have been nice to have seen the report written in relation to the revised local plan as per the inspector's recommendations because it's, it's it's been awfully difficult to try and relate it to that i'm i'm sure you can appreciate the time constraints everything is new for us isn't it yes do you want to know? um so of the request um the extension of time was requested prior to us receiving the um, inspector's final report. Um, we would only um, put the item on the agenda if an extension of time was agreed um, to allow it to be determined. And we haven't gone back um, to the agent or the applicant to ask for a further extension of time um, because we consider that the application is in a position that it can be determined. We don't need to wait until a decision is made on adoption um, as discussed in detail in the report um we don't think prematurity is a, a reason to withhold planning permission um it's the application is in a position that it can be determined thank you uh councillor simon bloxham thank you uh, yeah i'm going to be a real pain can i is it uh, possible to go back to some of the slides you had because i like particularly to look at the the one for access because I know that road very well. I've been in it a few times in a car, or should I say stopped in a car. Sorry, I know it's going to be a bit difficult to get it uh, get it rewound, but I just want to, to see that. Uh, more than happy, yeah. Not a problem. Uh, Councillor Nigel Mason. Thank you. Um, you referred to 40% social housing, I think, in your presentation, but you also then said uh, all matters reserved. So I just slightly 
um, concerned, does that mean that does that include the, the provision of 40 40 percent social housing? So how, how strong is the commitment to that? And and a, and a, I suppose a secondary question to that is: Could you indulge a new councillor on planning and remind us what social housing means in this context? Thank you. The affordable housing, the forty percent affordable housing, is secured in the Section One Hundred Six Agreement. Um, so, um, it's a percentage because this is an outline application. Um, so, it, the if approved, the approval is up to, um, so it's up to eighty-three dwellings. Um, so it you know could be less. So that's why it's a percentage of affordable affordable housing. But the forty percent is secured by the Section One a six agreement they're tied into that and um, the section 106 agreement does um give specifics for if it was to be 83 dwellings the percentage of properties and and divides it up but that um could be agreed to change if it was less properties in terms of um the split um yeah it's in on page 91 um it sets out the split and it sets out the section 106 agreement so um, the 40 percent of at least 40 percent affordable housing is 33 affordable dwellings on the basis of 83 dwellings so as i say um but obviously that would change if on a reserve butters application a lower figure was agreed and this is based on at least 65 percent social affordable rented units and 35 percent shared ownership units and that's our mix that is um, set out in our local plan Are we there yet? That's, this was Councillor Bloxham. So I'm just just taking note of it, really. So that, that is the main road, isn't it? Through from that you go through Codicaton, and that's the small turning that you go off if you if you just happen to want to go down towards St Albans area. Yeah, yes. it, I, I know it is. I'm just, just, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just, just checking. It, it's a very tight uh, little bit. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you. Um, just on the harms, um, can you tell me what, tell you how we came about the harms? How were they, what, how were they assessed? How did we come to those particular um, outcomes? Very substantial. What, what method was used? Was it a general overall method that's maybe we use periodic table or was that site individually assessed? Part of the assessment it is a, a judgment that we make in terms of um, the weight, um, the levels of harm. Um, also, we relied on the Greenbelt um, review that was part of um, the background papers for the um, local plan. So I looked at that in terms of, um, you know, the value of the site and how it was categorized in that um as part of the greenbelt review um but yes it is a judgment that's made um in terms of the levels of harm um that's attributed and that's discussed in detail in the report how those conclusions were reached yeah okay thank you, thank you. councillor thank you chair um i'm just uh, uh looking through at the first homes um, earlier in the report, it suggests that uh, I think it was eight of the uh, affordable homes would be first homes potentially, but then looking at the first homes actual uh, section, it's suggesting that they don't wish to take up on the first homes uh, uh, scheme. Um, is that something that we can require? Because obviously first homes are something that we should be looking to uh, provide. Um, yeah, with the first homes, I'll just find, if you bear with me, where I've got it in the report. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, first homes, this is again something that has um, come in since this application because it's been in a long time. Um, it's something that's come in more recently. And the situation with first homes um is that there were some transitional arrangements basically it's something that um we can ask for and we did and we put forward to the um applicant um that it's now the inclusion of first homes is now material planning consideration on all applications where we seek affordable units um 
And um, so on a case by case basis, the starting point is that we ask the applicant to consider it. Um, they came back then with a response that they um, didn't wish to pursue first homes. It's something we discuss with our housing supply officer, all these um, detailed matters. Um, and in the circumstances, I mean, we're in a sort of transition period with this anyway. Um, and it's something will be given greater consideration um, in the future. Um, but and we also there was um, a report, I think, that we provided um, or looking at this issue as well. Um, and in the circumstances, officers consider we took a view that it would not be appropriate to include first homes within the housing mix and the affordable housing mix proposed would reflect the local housing needs. So it's something that um, we asked for um, and they came back and gave a justification for not providing and we considered that was acceptable. And it's something we've discussed in detail with the housing supply officer. Uh, Councillor Tony Hunter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I thank the officer for a report that has probably wasted, not wasted. Um, I've spent probably three hours reading because I went through it twice. Um, it's very comprehensive. It involves a lot of the reserved matters to enable us to see the package um, that's being presented as far as outline is concerned. Um, but I thought it was probably prudent uh, for the officer to make it clear that what we're looking at here is an outline planning permission with access only. The reserve matters we could probably spend two or three hours discussing, and I think that takes us away from what we're actually here for. Thank you. So for that. Thank you, Chair. I suppose to us, I'm picking up on what Councillor Blocks was saying a little bit about Cowards Lane. I'm fairly familiar with that. So it is a very, very narrow road, and I'm just slightly concerned in terms of access. Obviously, I understand that the main access is, suppo is supposed to come out onto the main road, but I think we all know that traffic doesn't always go where we want it to go. And I'm thinking 83 houses, that's a lot of cars, and that is a very, very narrow road indeed. I'm just sort of worried about some sort of log jam there and I just want where is the reassurance that 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 the access down that side is not going to be a problem thank you um yes I mean it's the access I'm aware is a key issue and the impact on the highways network and it's discussed in detail in the report I mean as you're aware we very much rely on the advice of the highways authority and um they've considered the application and have not raised objections um and recommended conditions um so in that situation um officers view it is that it wouldn't be sustainable reason to refuse planning permission do you want to follow up a question? Supplementary question on that. I'm not. I'm. I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm just conscious of um, other times this has come up. When you say there's been nothing from highways, does that mean they've put, they've actually said they don't have concerns, or they just haven't? I'm, I'm loath to say haven't bothered to reply, but that they haven't responded. I did a detailed response. Um, responses on the application. Yeah. And okay, my apologies for missing yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other member questions? No? Right. Can we now uh, move on through to the speakers? First of all, objects is Chris Watts. May I welcome you to come and speak? We've got uh, five minutes. So before I start, um, the the office of very kindly updated uh, members on uh, my uh, client's representations by email regarding site visits, but she omitted one important email which came in regarding whether the development is actually needed in the context of the reduced level of housing need and supply that the inspector dealt with. Can I, I, think I, that's can I just um, Sorry. put in there because we had a lot of emails came in very late. Yes, I understand that. Very, very late. Some to me, some to members, some to officers, and so we tried to cover them as best we could. I understand that. Would you like to start your... Thank you, Chair, members, uh, for allowing me to speak on behalf of Mr and Mrs Barrow, who live at Hollods Farm. I wish to point, put the following points to you in support of a refusal. 
Firstly, as the officers themselves have confirmed tonight, the development would be inappropriate in a green belt and thus by definition cause harm to the green belt to which significant weight should be given. Elsewhere in the same report, the officers conclude individually uh, that there will be harm to the openness of the green belt, there will be harm to the rural setting of Codicot, harm to its landscape setting, harm to the heritage significance of various listed buildings in the high street and hedgerows. It is also explicitly acknowledged that the proposed development would inevitably result in an increase in traffic, adding to congestion already in the high street, particularly at peak times. They also add there will be an impact on the Hollard's Farm wildlife site, which my clients own. Now, one can always argue about the weight given by officers to such acknowledged harms, minor, moderate, significant, and whether mitigation proposals are sufficient to overcome them. I understand that. However, objectors and others and ourselves have always argued about the weighting given by, to many of these Greenbelt harms by officers in various Greenbelt reviews through the local plan process as being too low and which do not reflect on this site the substantial level of harm that would inevitably result through the development of 83 dwellings on this site, particularly to openness. And I ask you to look again at that indicative site layout drawing and you'll see what I mean. It would appear the local plan inspector has also fallen for the officer's rather laid back approach in Greenbelt reviews, which appears to be the main uh, area that you've drawn from to do your assessments for harm from what you've just said um, and he himself acknowledges this is not a large site in my view it will completely destroy the rural and landscape setting of the village at this end and result in a complete loss of openness and rural character on the site site cd1 is very different from others proposed around codicot its function as the first area at this end of the village maintains the separation of two settlements of codicot and wellen that is a key Greenbelt purpose, and its landscape and rising topography are very different to those other sites. In relation to ecology, uh, I've noted that uh, they've ex the Hearts Ecology and the Council have accepted a six metre width of land for the most part on the site. Does this mean to say that my clients, Mr and Mrs Barrow, uh, have got to provide the other six metres where that's um, deficient? This can't be right. Surely it should be 12 metres around the whole of the developer's land holding. I also cannot believe, as stated in the paragraph 43179, that new infrastructure required for the development will be neutral in the planning balance, in effect, cause no harm. The officers, rightly, have set out a number of very special circumstances, which they conclude should override the presumption against the development. However, I don't think the officers have given the correct weight to many Greenbelt and other harms already identified in that report, and we believe it will be unsafe to grant planning permission. I'm also frankly amazed the officers feel that 83 dwellings can be comfortably accommodated on the site, see page 82. Despite the assurance in the same paragraph that the proposal is up, up to 83 dwellings, giving the impression that if this number is not possible, then it could be reduced through the future reserve matters applications. However, of course, if less dwellings result, if a full 12 metre wildlife buffer strip is required within the site in full, then of course, less affordable housing would also be brought forward than currently assumed, no doubt on viability grounds. The same report advises in relation to the essential expansion of education facilities at Codicott Primary School. This is now achievable because of the Heath Lane appeal decision, but that appeal decision has not taken into account other residential developments on brownfield land within the village. The village primary school is now already becoming a two-class entry school. The local plan inspector's report has only just been loaded up onto your website. And given its length and recommendations, I feel the application really should be deferred, notwithstanding the issues of prematurity, which I fully understand, until after the October full council meeting, which I understand could well be debating this report. If not, and the application is taken to a decision tonight, I would ask on behalf of Mr and Mrs Barrow that it be refused on the grounds that the harms the officers themselves have identified to Greenbelt openness, the site's rural setting and character, landscape character, visual amenity, harm to public views, traffic congestion, and the impact on the ecology of Holland's Farm wildlife site, when taken collectively together, should be given greater weight than the collective very special circumstances put forward by the officers in that same report. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions of clarification? 
from the members. Just questions of clarification. About what Mr. Watts has said. No, it's all clear. Good. Can I invite uh, Paul Watson to speak in support of the application? Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, as the committee is aware, the site is proposed for to be allocated for residential development under policy CD1 of the Emerging Local Plan. Your officer's report provides a comprehensive review of the application. And based on this, as you've heard, recommends that outline planning permission be granted subject to conditions and a legal agreement. The legal agreement is already in a very much agreed format and secures 40% affordable housing, which is a full policy compliant level. It also delivers a number of financial contributions towards local infrastructure. These include local highway schemes, bus services, local nursery provision, primary and secondary education, health services, sports and open space, amongst other elements. The report helpfully sets these out in a table at 43185 of the report. As you've also heard, in the period between the publication of the original report and this meeting this evening, the inspector's findings into the, into the draft local plan have been published. As you're aware, the inspector fully endorses the plan and explains the very thorough assessment and scrutiny that has taken place during its examination, particularly in respect of issues surrounding housing needs, the green belt, and the proposed allocations, including this application site. I briefly highlight the following. At paragraph 62, the inspector comments, it is wholly apparent to me that the need for new homes in North Hertfordshire is both acute and pressing. Delivering has fallen well short of the identified need for some considerable time. Allowing this pattern to continue would doubtlessly lead to continued squeeze on the housing market, rising house prices, and the continuation of household formation being suppressed. In short, many people to slip seeking to live in their own home within the district would be able to do so. On the council's Greenbelt review at paragraph 163, the inspector confirms the Greenbelt review and its update represent a robust evidential basis for determining the existence or otherwise of exceptional circumstances necessary to alter the Greenbelt boundaries. On the overall plan strategy at paragraph 483 and 487, the inspectors explains that the supply of identified deliverable or developable land outside of the green belt falls well short of the need. Indeed, it is less than half. It is impossible to see how anything even close to approaching the need for housing could be met without green belt release. Without this, the consequences for sustainable development would be significant. This would involve either building new homes in considerably less sustainable locations away from the areas where they are needed or not delivering them at all. The inspector specifically comments on this application site at paragraph 281. He notes, the site is not large compared to many allocations proposed in the plan. And while the homes on it will extend the village southwards, they would not run beyond the collection of buildings at Hollard's farm. The Greenbelt Review update puts the harm at the Greenbelt as moderate. In my view, Given the size of the site, the relationship with the existing buildings, it would be moderate at most. Indeed, it seems to me that the presence of Hollard's Farm would visually contain the new homes within the existing village envelope. This effect will ameliorate their impact on the Greenbelt. Finally, concluding, as Ms. Raynard noted in her presentation, the inspector concludes at 496 that the proposed housing allocations are justified, effective, consistent with national policy, and have been positively prepared. In summary, after detailed and lengthy scrutiny, the inspector fully supports the council's plan. Policy CD1, which proposes to allocate the site, includes a number of criteria against which the planning application is to be assessed. Your officer's report notes that all of these criteria have been complied with and that there are no statutory objections from any of the technical consultees. Whilst the current master plan is indicative, it does demonstrate how a soft edge to the site, so, so, and so a sensitive interface with the village can be created and the 12 meter buffer provided to the Hollands Farm Wildlife Site. Members will, of course, have the opportunity to fully review a detailed layout and proposals for the site as part of future reserve matters submissions. 
It is clear that the site occupies a sustainable location that development here would deliver a high quality environment for future occupiers, including the full policy compliant of level of affordable housing. In this context, we do hope that members will feel able to support the officer's recommendation and so resolve to grant the application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Do members have any questions for clarification, Mr. Watson? No? Thank you. Um, Naomi Renard, would you like to respond? Please, I'd like to respond to a few of the points um, made. Um, firstly, um, there's discussion about harm and um, as is set out in the report, um, officers have reached the view that the um, proposal would cause harm to the Greenbelt. Um, but I'd just like to reiterate, it's just been mentioned, that the um, inspector um, comments on harm. And as has always been read out, he said the Greenbelt review update puts the harm to the Greenbelt as moderate. And um, we're speaking earlier about how it's assessed. And that's something that I used in my assessments is um, the Greenbelt review update. Um, and the inspector goes on to say, um, in my view, given the size of the site and the relationship with the existing buildings here, it would be, it would be moderate at most. Um, I think another thing to take into account um, when considering harm is the recent decision at Heath Lane. Um, and obviously that was uh, more houses and a more exposed site. Um, and a, a view was taken that, um, as, as you're aware, that was allowed at appeal. And so that's a material planning consideration when considering this application. Um, another point that was raised um, was heritage harm. Um, as the report sets out, it's considered there wouldn't be harm to listed buildings in the assessment. Um, when we're looking at um, impact on um, heritage assets, um, the conclusion was reached, um, there'll be a small level of harm has been identified to the significance of heritage assets, namely the hedgerows. Um, this harm is considered to be less than substantial, so and at the lower end of that spectrum. So in line with the MPPF, paragraph 202, if you're looking at where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a de designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. And I think we've gone through in detail in the report the public benefits of providing much needed um, market and affordable housing. Um, with regards to the, I know we've discussed in quite a bit of detail the 12 metre buffer, but there was a mention about whether the neighbours would need to provide the other six metres and that wouldn't be the case. It's been considered that um, as proposed with, with the 12 metres adjacent to the wildlife site and the six metres on some of the other boundaries, what's been put forward, there's been um, the Hearts Ecology have not raised an objection to that. Um, also was mentioned um, that the impact on infrastructure um i just find the relevant paragraph bear with me a moment um just before the table on the section 106 um i think the comment was made with regard to that addressing the impact of the development on facilities and infrastructure would be neutral in the planning balance the reason for that is that the section 106 secures um money towards the mitigation of impacts on infrastructure that's why it's reached the conclusion of neutral. Um, the other comment was made um, was with regard to the primary school and um, we rely heavily obviously on the Hearts County Council advice and we um, their assessment of these applications and the contributions they requested are based on um, the four sites in Codicott. Um, I understand they take into account a 20% uplift in terms of the figures that are put forward. Um, I know you mentioned um, brownfield sites, um, but I mean, we have to rely on the county council's um, modelling and um, projections, and that's what we have done. And they've taken into account the four sites. Um, I, hopefully that answers answers the queries. Thank you. Uh, shall we go to debate? Councillor David Levitt. Thank you, Chair. As Councillor Hunter uh, pointed out earlier on, this is an outline application uh, um, with all matters reserved apart from access. Purpose of an outline application is to establish the principle and the type of development on the site, and we've been given an indicative, indicative um, out, out, 
uh, layout for the site and the number of houses on there, which is up to 83. And we've been given the details of the access uh, to the highways network. The principle of development also covers, covers sustainability. Within sustainability, you're also looking at access for pedestrians. Now, there's no pedestrian access or anything approved. There's a number of comments in the report round about 4.3.90 0 onwards. Uh, comments such as, while it, whilst it would have been preferable to have these high works, highways works plans at this stage, officers were concerned in order to meet the requirements. Officers were also concerned with regards to conditions for making that recommended highways authority. Uh, and it covers other bits like that. What does concern me is the um, pedestrian access. It, the sustainability relies heavily um, on the proposed one about the increased bus services. And I know these will be covered at reserve matters stage, but it's also part of the sustainability um, by having extra increased buses and, the act, and how close is the bus stops. And it's, it's sustainable because of that. The report actually says that um, there are a number of bus stops. I'm just trying to find the right paragraph. Uh, the site would also be within walking distance of a number of existing bus stops. The nearest bus stops are located along the high streets, stops which are 200 metres from the site. This would allow for, allow for sustainable modes of transport beyond Cotty Cot, the wide range of nearby towns. Uh, the number of bus stops nearby is two, both in the high street. Um, the one on the side of the road nearest the site is 390 metres from the proposed site entrance. The one on the other side of the road is 450 metres from the proposed site entrance. Uh, from the site entrance to the back of the site is another 298 metres. I don't actually consider that really a sustainable walking distance for somebody. Um, to make this a sustainable site under those terms and, and highways are making big point about um, settlement hierarchy and, and plans and that, that it's not a car based it's a people based and um, just like to comment on that and let, let a few other people comment on it and I, I don't know where that 200 meter figure came from but it's nowhere near 200 meters. Um, I think to clarify, um, in terms of the pedestrian access, there's access, pedestrian access direct to, onto the high street. Um, I'm sorry if the figures are wrong in terms of distance to bus stops, but um, the section 106 has secured, um, there's a sustainable transport contribution which is pulled towards um, a south and central growth transport plan and also towards the expansion of the bus service through Codicott. Um, this ties in with the Heath Lane decision and um, that was in that section 106 as well and the idea this money would be pulled from the four sites and um, towards those improvements um, and access to bus stops is sort of a key um, long-standing um, measure of sustainability in um, previous appeal decisions. Um, so sorry if the, the measurements are wrong, but um, it was considered that this um, would be a site and um, when the Highways Authority have looked at it, um, they've looked at improvements. There's also a condition um, relating to improvements to bus stops as well. And um, so that's something that um, we've tried to cover um, in considering the application is improving the sustainability of the site. Thank you. Um... I, I, the point I was trying to make was that I don't think these are sustainable because of the distances were wrong. And, and I, I don't think it's, it's all based around sustainability. I don't think this, this, they are sustainable. I don't think it, uh, public transport is a sustainable alternative means of access. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Simon Bloxham. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I do think we do need, need housing. Uh, and I think we, it's been mentioned a couple of times that uh, this housing isn't really needed in, in this area. I think we need housing everywhere. And I think the green belt is something, unfortunately, that um, we do need to look at. I'm not saying it's right or wrong in this particular incidence. But I think my main issue with this 
is access onto that main road from from where it is and i think it's horrendous uh, if if you have uh, had the unfortunate um uh time to, to to go along there at rush hour particularly in the evening well good luck if you're coming from a side street to get onto that main road because it is particularly poor and and if it were to go ahead i would i would particularly like some uh, specific measures to make that safe because i do believe we're looking at a safety issue for this particular uh area of the development because i think that access onto that main road is potentially hazardous thank you Thank you. Any any other comments in the debate from the members? Uh, Councillor Ian Moody. Yeah, I'm just going to. I'm, <clears throat> I'm obviously the ward councillor for Coldicut. Um, that junction is absolutely horrendous. There's actually a rise as you come out of Coward's Lane up the hill, and um, the amount of vehicles that I've seen swerve or break hard because people have run out that junction is horrendous. Coward's Lane. There's no footpath anywhere near Cowards Lane. There's no, there's no re, there's no facility to put a footpath in there. I do consider the entrance very, very dangerous. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tony Hunter. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, the, this gets very difficult because if you look at the actual access itself, and obviously highways have, they've put forward uh, a method of dealing with it so that the site can be entered. Now, they've also moved uh, the actual entrance um, to the lane. Um, it's going to be very difficult for us as a committee to actually turn around and say highways have got it wrong. Um, if we tried that route, I feel we would fail miserably as far as an inspector is concerned. And uh, that's something I get very nervous about in the sense that highways are highways. They are there to do their job. We might not agree with them. We might think they're wrong. And sometimes I firmly believe they're wrong, uh, but they have to work within a framework as well. The same as we have to within the MPPF and the Emerging Local Plan. It's very difficult, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. Councillor Alistair Willoughby. Um, uh, one question I would um, like to ask is, were other methods of access um, considered? I, I... For example, uh, as as it's been suggested by uh, other members, that uh, accessing uh, that area is quite difficult. Um, would something like a roundabout solve some of those issues? And therefore, you know, so you can actually access that road. So it's it's sort of more equitable how you access it. Is that something that's been considered at all? Response to that. Yes, I'll come back on that and the other comments made. In terms of the highways access, um, it's something that's been um, looked at over some time with the highways authority and negotiated. Um, I think they, this access has been put forward. I think um, the reasoning behind it was to improve, try and improve the existing situation, um, which has been commented on um, the existing access. Um, and as it's been commented that we rely very much on highways advice and there are conditions that have been put forward um, to um to address highway safety um, and understand um it would be part of a highway safety audit so those are all issues that highways would would cover and they provided detailed comments and, and looked at the application so we're very much guided by their um, technical advice thank you any more comments in the debate where should we go from here Oh, Councillor uh, Alistair Willoughby. Um, I would I'd say that I, I think if access was our only uh, uh, hang up, which it seems to be in the debate, uh, that we should move to accept. Um, to grant Are you proposing? Right. I am proposing. Um, Small point of clarification, yeah. if I may. Um, having read this, um, there's, uh, where are we? In the recommendations, item number four. Um, I've obviously misread this because I couldn't access one of the plans, um, revised highway works plans, where it says there's a provision of hard surface pedestrian route internally within the site 
of at least a two meter width running parallel to Cowards Lane and the southern side of the full extent of the site boundary. And God bless you, uh, Councillor Bloxham, uh, with a hard surface pedestrian link to the northwest. Now, I've read that as linking in to the actual access of the site. Uh, have I read that correctly? Um, yes, basically, um, I don't um, I don't know if we can have the access plan up again, sorry. Um, what, where this came from was um, highways had recommended a condition um, to create a two metre pedestrian walkway along Cowards Lane. That would, we were concerned, that would re result in a removal of, oh, we can see here, a large amount of um, hedgerow. So what the condition is asking is that... Um, that detailed plans would need to be submitted that showed a footpath that's the site side of Cowards Lane. So effectively, rather than um, requiring people, as, as they do at the moment, to walk along um, Cowards Lane itself, there would be a footpath, the, the site side, um, a pedestrian footpath, the site side, which would mean um, to the south, which would mean that, um, I mean, obviously we can't stop people walking on the road, that would be their choice, but to encourage people to walk along the pedestrian footpath um, within the site, um, that would mean, I mean, obviously not all the hedgerow would need to be, be able to be retained, there will be need to be some removed for the access to make it safe, and also a pedestrian access um, next to Oakley back onto Cowards Lane, but um, we felt as officers we were concerned about the highway's recommendation to create that on the actual, actual Cowards Lane itself, as it would result in a removal of a lot of hedgerow, so we thought a uh, a positive alternative would be to have that within the site and that's something that would be worked out in the discharge of conditions and the reserve matters thank you i think we got there in the end didn't we on that thank you very much can i go back to councillor uh Willoughby? thank you uh, thank you chair i uh, continue to propose to grow <laughs> thank you do we have anyone second in the proposal Uh, I've got two now. Uh, Tom, Councillor Tom Tyson? Yes, I'm happy to second that. Thank you. So we've got a proposed seconder. Can we go to the vote, please, Will? Sorry. Page 110 uh, of the report. Uh, it states about um, off site highways work referred to in condition X and X. And the numbers haven't been put in. I know it's a small point, but. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, it's in one of the updates. Um, it should refer to conditions 17 and 18 of updates yes, down the system. That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> For the vote. Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson, if you wish to leave, you may do so. Item 7, 21 uh, slash 02957, land on the southwest side of Barquay Road, Royston, Hertfordshire. Erection of 10 dwellings. Two by two times two bed, two times the comfort break. Yes, five minutes.
Okay. Um, <laughs> item seven. 21-02957, land on the southwest side of Barkway Road, Royston, Hertfordshire. Erection of 10 dwellings, two times two bed, two times three bed, four times four bed, and two, five, two times five bed houses, with ancillary works, including alterations to existing vehicular access, new access road, parking, and landscaping. Please note supplementary agenda pack contain addendum to the report. Tom Ray to present. This is, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a few updates. Um, as you've mentioned, Chair, um, the first one is that members will be aware of the recent um, inspector's report on the local plan um, <coughs> review, um, the, the local plan 2011 to 2031. And the addendum, which you just mentioned, Chair, on the, on the website, summarising the key recommendations and conclusions of the inspector, particularly in terms of whether the plans provision for new housing and the housing allocations are justified. Um, with the publication of this report and subject to the modifications, the inspector has found the plan is sound, uh, legally compliant and capable of adoption. It is your officer's view that the policies and the site allocations in the emerging local plan can now be given very significant weight. At the time of writing this report, um, it was considered that substantial weight could be attached to policies SB2 and policy RY11, which is specific to this site. Clearly, with the publishing of the inspector's report, um, the local plan has even greater weight now, and members are asked to take this into account when considering the principle of the development. Um, secondly, Chair, I have received a couple of uh, late representations, um, both of which re reiterate previous objections, but um, just briefly, uh, Occupier 25, Shepherds Close, um, reiterates concerns about the impact of plots 7, 8 and 9 in particular on residents in Shepherds Close, and the Occupier of number 19, Shepherds Close, uh, would like to um, reiterate the following points. Um, uh, concerned at the design, height and proximity of the houses and the loss of privacy to Shepherds Close residents. Um, considers an archaeological survey should be carried out, concerned at traffic, concerned at the town's infrastructure not being able to cope with more development, um, concerns at um, damage to existing properties that might occur through construction, concern at health and safety issues, um, and the expectation that the development would be later in the planned period. Also concern around um, some of the surveys, including the BAT surveys, and uh, what design codes have been used by the council in assessing the development. Uh, thirdly, Chair, um, just a, a, a minor point to um, correct the Section 106 table. Um, the County Council's Growth and Infrastructure Officer has noted that the report doesn't include reference to the monitoring fee which is charged by the County Council as part of the Section 106. This charge of £340 for each trigger point within the legal agreement should be added to the Section 106 table as set out um, on page 129 of the agenda, uh, agenda report rather. Finally, Chair, I, although I've mentioned in the report, uh, there needs to be some additional wording added, added to Condition 9 um, and that is to ensure that the final BAT surveys and any mitigation required as a, as a result of those surveys are carried out. So condition nine should read as follows. The development hereby approved shall be carried out in accordance with the recommendations and mitigation measures set out in the submitted BAT survey, BAT survey report by Three Counties Ecology, the pre preliminary e ecological assessment, and the potential route assessment, August 2021. So if we could just go to the uh, photographs and slides now, Chair. Uh, Councillor Muir, can I just ask you to move back a row so that those watching on TV know who is in the, the committee and who, who's observing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Could I just move to the slides now, Chair, please?
Thank you, Will. Uh, so this first slide is the general location of the site um, in the sh a shaded area, and uh, members will see the proximity of Shepherd's Close uh, immediately to the northwest. Markway Road is to the um, east, and the public uh, bridleway number 10 um, is to the western side of the site. Thank you. This is a more general location plan, and you see the proximity of the uh, site to the, the built up area of Royston and the density of development, particularly immediately to the northwest, but then further afield and other parts of uh, Royston. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of the entrance to the site. The houses either side of the power cable there have already been built. They are part of the allocation. There are three detached houses there. Um, next slide, please. This is a slide looking into the site, the rear of those three houses, and to, to the right there, you'll see some of the properties in Shepherd's Close and the um, general gradient of the site as it slopes down towards the western boundary. Next slide, please. This is uh, number 31, Shepherd's Close at the very far end of the site, the far end nearest to the bridleway. And that's um, the, um, the side elevation of that property. Thank Next slide, please. This is looking back up the site towards the, the three frontage properties. And you'll see the power cable there going through the middle of those properties across Barkway Road and then on to the east. And then further properties in Shepherd's uh, Close just to the left. Next slide, please. Another uh, photograph showing the Shepherd's Close properties. You'll see that the site slopes down slightly from those properties. Um, there's a variety of uh, boundary fences along, along that boundary there with various um, outbuildings and, and sheds in, in some of the properties there. And there's also some significant tree screening there. You'll see some tree screening to the left and to the right, as well as the boundary fences. Next slide, please. This is a um, photograph take looking north along Bridleway number 10, um, which um, runs north into Royston and the with the application site to the right. Next slide, please. Again, this is a photograph of the entrance to the site, and this will be modified to include a footpath into the site. And again, uh, looking northwards towards uh, Royston. Next slide, please. And then looking um, southwards, um, this is another um, uh, photograph of the of the other house, the left hand side of the access. Next slide, please. And then general view looking into the site. Quite a lot of the site is um, paddock land, um, fairly open, although there are some um, um, areas of, of uh, trees and particularly in the south um, southwest corner. Next slide, please. And this is um, an existing uh, hard surfaced area and storage sheds on the eastern part of the site. Next slide, please. Just moving to the plans, this is the, the, the layout plan for the site. You'll see there are um, uh, five dwellings each side of the access um, with a central access and turning head um, towards the western boundary. There is also a footpath access um, punching through the um, uh, the, the western boundary uh, into the bridal way, uh, number 10. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the um, elevations um, um, of uh, the sections of the site. The top elevation there is as would be viewed from the properties in um, Shepherd's Close. So you'll see there are, um, uh, there isn't a back-to-back -back relationship here. These are um, side-facing side um, uh, views and with uh, quite substantial gaps between the dwellings there with some additional landscaping. The bottom section is um, the uh, photograph, uh, sorry, uh, a view of the where the access would uh, go through the centre of the site between uh, plots nine and ten and plot two. Next slide please. Another location plan showing the, um, the Shepherd's Close development to the north. Next slide please. These are some of the um, elevations and um, floor plans of the house of the houses. This is um, type type house type F. You'll see that um, there's a mixture of materials, cladding and brickwork, and um, 
fairly shallow rooms. There isn't any um, two and a half storey accommodation within this development. It, it's all two storey. Next slide, please. This is one of the larger units with attached double garage um, and uh, with parking in front of the garage. Next slide, please. Uh, another house type, same sort of um, external materials. Next slide, please. And this is the pair of two bedroomed um, dwellings uh, located on the um, northeastern part of the site near where the access enters into the site. Next slide, please. And uh, another house type. This is a, a three bedroom unit, um, similar materials uh, with similar um, features such as um, chimneys. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And again, uh, um, I think we've seen that one before, actually. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a view of the sections of the internal, uh, from the internal um, access uh, road, showing the um, houses stepping down um, from the uh, east to the western part of the site. Next slide, please. Thank you, Chair. That's um, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from members for the officer? Uh, Councillor David Levitt. Um, yeah, just from on the, if you, if you can go back to it possibly, where does the power line run in relation to the dwellings and the road? Does it run sort of down the road? Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, yes, it runs directly above the uh, access road. Uh, Councillor Tom Tyson. Um, yeah, just a relatively minor one, really, but um, I was trying to figure out where the bridleway goes to, or, or footpath or cycle path, whichever use it might, fi might find. Does it go down uh, into town? Um, I'm not sure of the direct route. Um, it does head northwards into central Royston. I think it might. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can't be exactly sure. Sorry, can't answer that one. Thank you. Any other questions from members for the officer? Can I go over to the registered speakers? We've got uh, Mr. Roger Mead, who is speaking in objection to the application. Mr. Mead, are you ready? Thank you, Chair and members. Um, I've come here in total naivety to this. This is rather over professional for me. Um, the main thing I came here for was to try and um, talk about really just plot seven and eight, because plot seven and eight are so intrusive on the current people who live in Shepherd's Close. It's going to be so close to our building. They're going to be above the height of our building. They're going to take away light. Um, I've done, I had no mention of any light surveys being done in any way. I've done a light survey. I've done it over a month. I'm retired, so I've got the time to do this. This is one particular day, um, if I'm allowed to mention this, is that uh, ranging from 8.15 to 14.15, and this is ranging from the middle of October through to the middle of March, is that uh, I could lose up to 88% of light coming into my property and also my neighbour's property, number 25 because of the height of them and the way the sun tracks from east to west, there's no consideration about this intrusion. Also on the property number, uh, it's plot seven, um, it's showing a window that will look directly into my property and into my neighbor's property. There's no obscure glass on in, in anything. Um, in my naivety of coming here, was hoping to make some suggestions about how this plan could be put forward without in fact impacting on the um, developer in that way is to like make plot seven and eight single story, turn plot seven so it goes behind the trees and put the garage behind the uh, residents that are already there. But of course, um, it has been pointed out to me by a, uh, somebody that, uh, you're not here to consider changes to plans. Well, this was my naivety of coming here to do that. 
But my main issue is, is really the privacy. I've lived where I've lived for over 40 years now, and I've had the privilege of that view. Um, I know view is not a guarantee in any way, but now that's going to be taken away. But not only that, I'm going to lose a rather large percentage of the light that's coming in because due to the um, the power cable, the, the gentleman mentioned, that runs up, everything has to be pushed so far back that we've only got a metre a meter and a half of the property before our boundary lines. Um, so really, this is the main reason that I came here was to object on to them two plots, was not to the actual development. We all need development in Royston, and there is quite a bit going on with the Meridian sites, the sites down on the A505 leading up to McDonald's, and it's all to the good benefit, although Royston's infrastructure is struggling in its own way, but then again, I think everybody is. But that was the main reason that I came here, was to talk about the intrusion of losing my privacy, losing my light, and losing that sort of view. But as I say, I can't guarantee a view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mead. Um, I'm going to ask now if members have got any um, questions, clarification of, from you, and then the officers will have a chance to actually respond to what you said. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions for clarification from the members? No. Can I then ask um, Tom Ray if he would like to respond to any points or issues raised? Thank you, Chairman, uh, for that. Um, Yes, I understand what Mr. Mead's um, concerns there regarding daylight and sunlight. And for that very reason, um, we asked the applicant to obtain a daylight and sunlight assessment. And uh, a report has been produced by a company called Abbey Consultants, which accompanies the application. And that um, is based on the industry standard guide, the uh, building research establishment um, document. Um, um, which um, is, I'll just refer to that for you, Chair, um, site layout planning for daylight and sunlight. And that, con that looks at um, both daylight and sunlight um, in, uh, to uh, any adjoining properties and uh, what um, levels of daylight and sunlight would be available to those properties before and after the development. Um, there are a number of calculations in that document, but essentially it concludes, um, well, in fact, I will read out the concluding paragraph. Um, the report says, the numerical results confirm that the impact of the proposed development on the light receivable by the nine uh, existing dwellings at numbers nine to 27 Shepherd's Close are in full accordance with good practice. And therefore the proposed development design satisfies all of the requirements set out in the BRE guide site layout planning for daylight and sunlight. Um, in terms of the overlooking issue, which Mr. Mead uh, mentioned, there is a condition on page 135, which uh, requires any first floor windows facing northwards towards Shepherd's Close properties to be obscure glazed. Um, so hopefully that will cover the loss of privacy issue. And lastly, on the distances, I think Mr. Mead mentioned between the new development and the intervening boundary um the I've got a couple of uh, figures here the, the nearest distance uh plot eight would be almost four meters uh, plot seven would be four meters away from the boundary and plot eight would be uh, five meters at the nearest point uh, there's also some new landscaping al along that boundary thank you chair thank you um mr ray i hope that is informative for you, um, Mr. Mead. Shall we go to the debate? Um, Councillor Simon Bloxham. Thank you. Um, I just wanted uh, a bit of clarification, actually, I think. the uh, Mr. Ray was saying about the survey for um, uh, light and shadowing uh, being for properties 9 to 27, whereas I think Mr. Mead was talking about 
27, uh, Mr. Mead lives at 27. 27 to number 17. Yeah. So Mr. Mead, you, I live at 27. Right. Okay. So that so the properties you were talking about were the the numbering for the new site if it was in. No. Okay. Could you refer to me, please? To be honest, I'm not. Yeah. No. I know. And when when uh, Miss Mead was talking, it sounded to me like he was talking about um, number eight and and whatever, and that wasn't in the uh, in the survey that uh, I thought that it wasn't in the survey that Mr. Ray was talking about. That so that's what I want clarification on from yeah, Mr. Okay. Ray. Sorry, Chairman. I just um, try and clarify that you'll see on the um, location plan, which is attached to the agenda report. Um, You'll see there's a central section of properties in um, Shepherd's Close with their back gardens backing onto the site. Their number is 9 to 27. And that's what this daylight and sunlight test has focused on, the impact of development on those properties. And my question really was, does that cover the, um, uh, the properties belonging to Mr. Mead? And I'm, I'm assuming that does then, yeah? Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tony Hunter. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think Mr. Ray's answered my question, but just to uh, clarify that it's perfectly clear that all um, windows that are actually overlooking Shepherd's Close on the second floor will be obscured. And uh, I, I understand the daylight and the BRE. Um, that seems to be not overlooking, um, but on the actual landscaping, uh, I see there's a condition in there. Could we pay special attention to making sure that substantial landscaping goes in on that boundary? Wish to respond to that. Um, yes, that's condition number four, um, requiring full details of hard and soft landscape, landscaping, as well as boundary treatment, um, and also reinforced by condition five, which requires the landscaping to be replaced if any of it for some reason is, is lost um, within the um, early, early years of the development being implemented. There's also further um, conditions about uh, none of the trees that are shown to be retained on the plan. There's quite a few trees to be retained, um, shouldn't be removed from the site without um, approval from the council either. Thank you. Uh, Councillor David Levitt. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I've had some concerns about the number of trees being removed, uh, but did note the conditions about the ones that stay are quite tightly conditioned on what happens to them. That's first, I think that's the first time I've seen a condition like that. Uh, quite so tight on it about having to replace them. So quite welcome that condition. Uh, note the landscaping condition as well. Um, only word of caution I would add to that is trees grow taller than houses. So if you plant a lot of trees along a boundary, the light uh, issue becomes uh, a bit worse from the landscaping uh, than it does from the development. So I, I would um, just ask people to bear that in mind when they approve the landscaping details in 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 the end uh with that in mind chair i would uh, move the recommendation to grant permission on this site um yes um living in great ashby and then having great power lines going through our, our buildings i just wonder if there's any safety considerations of this power line going down the, the center of the road um, i think there was meant to be for the bigger pylons there's, there's something like a 50 meter um width of, of uh, you can't build under them but uh, i know this is a smaller thing but i just uh, want to make sure there's no safety considerations we've missed thank you chair um the the issue about safety is um very much the domain of the health and safety executive. Um, uh, but there is also an organization uh, called the 
um, Energy Networks Association, and that produces um, safety guidance on working practices and construction near to um, power lines. And this particular power line is um, of the, 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 the smallest, the lowest voltage that you can get. It's not the same category as the very large transmission lines um, that, that you see um, on the, the, the sort of gantry type. And from my research, I think the, the minimum distances are something like three meters. Uh, in this case, the access, the, the, the nearest houses are approximately six meters away from the um, the, the other line of the power line. Thank you. Is that okay. May I go back to Councillor Tony Hunter? Apologise to Councillor Levitt. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, um, I'm moving the recommendation. I'm happy to second that. Thank you. Can we go to the vote, please, Will? Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Yes. Um, item eight is planning appeals. Tom Allison to present. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there, as you, as you have seen on the agenda, there's a list of seven uh, appeal decisions that we've received to report on. Um, of those seven, um, two were withdrawn, leaving us with five. Um, of those five, they are all delegated decisions. Um, in my opinion, none of them are hugely contentious or notable appeal decisions. So I won't go through them in turn. I will just ask if members have any queries or questions on any of the particular appeal decisions. Any questions, but any particular ones? Okay. So that um, concludes our business for this evening. Sorry, late call. Sorry, Chair. I just noticed um, the gentleman who spoke on the last debate and the Ms. other Lee. gentleman. Yeah. Obviously, they've the the, mat, the matter finished, so they've left. We probably all, I don't know if it's possible. I mean, obviously, I we can't leave to escort, to show them out. There. I don't mean escort them out of the building, but out of politeness, it seems someone should escort them out of the building. Now we can't do it. The officers here presumably can't do because we all have to be in the debate. I just wonder if we could consider that because I, I just thought it seemed terribly rude. We let members of the public just find their own way out of the building. Will what is normal on this? <laughs> I would dearly like to be able to have two committee clerks present at every meeting, but unfortunately, I'm the only person on site tonight. Yeah, and you um, can't do it. So, I, yeah, yeah. So. Ideally, it would be nice if I could just yes. escort members out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, you sometimes staff impression members, I'm not able to have okay. yeah. Sorry, you. just yes. Yeah, thank you for that observation. Thank Something you. to bear in mind. Thank you. Um, I will close the meeting at. 917. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, God. <laughs>